organizers for forcing me to give the last talk. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll uh, talk to you today uh, about uh, the, the covering radius and dense lattice subspaces. Um, but uh, um, what I'll start with is actually, um, I guess, a sort of motivation um, for where uh, this, uh, these uh, problems ca came from for me, which is in the context of uh, integer programming. Um, and this is going to, uh, to relate to some of the motivation that uh, Noah mentioned in the first talk of the week. Uh, and um, I, I'll give you sort of an impressionistic view of some of the, the tools associated with algorithms for integer programming uh, that um, maybe are not entirely familiar. Uh, and I'll connect it to uh, a conjecture uh, of uh, uh, Kanan and Lovas, which would imply faster uh, algorithms uh, for integer programming. Uh, and then we will kind of specialize this uh, to the context of the Euclidean norm. Uh, and we will see that even there, there are many connections to convex geometry. And uh, there will be connections to this reverse Minkowski uh, theorem that uh, no one had dead proved. OK. So uh, starting uh, from uh, the integer programming problem, uh, for me, I'm going to think of uh, having, say, some uh, polytope, or more generally, uh, a convex body. Uh, and I want to decide whether there's an integer point. And usually, we will always find such an integer point uh, algorithmically um, in, uh, in the algorithms. Uh, and a question that's been uh, open for, for a long time uh, is whether there is a, a single exponential time algorithm for this problem. Uh, such as we now have for uh, CVP and essentially all of most of the, the Euclidean norm problems, uh, we have single exponential time algorithms, uh, but we do not have them uh, for uh, integer programming. Um, and uh, uh, just the brief, very brief algorithmic history. Um, the first algorithm uh, was due to uh, Hendrik Lenstra, who uh, noticed that you could use uh, basis reduction and uh, tools from the geometry of numbers. And this was improved by uh, uh, Ravi, uh, who gave uh, an n to the order n time algorithm. And apart from the constant and the exponent, these are the best uh, types of complexities we have. Um, so I'm going to, uh, as I said, give you sort of an impressionistic view of uh, the, some of the tools that have been developed to attack this problem uh, that more or less will reduce it uh, to uh, getting uh, improvements, not quite two to the end, but getting improvements to a nice geometric conjecture. Um, so uh, roughly uh, speaking, at a very high level, um, the algorithms for, for solving the feasibility problem kind of uh, decompose into something like uh, a rounding step, where you try and sort of find the center of your convex body and round to the nearest uh, integer point. Uh, and that you can interpret as some sort of generalized version of the closest vector problem. Um, and when that doesn't work, uh, you try and break your problem up uh, into pieces. And that's the decomposition step. Uh, and uh, the key primitive that is essentially behind, in fact, both of these uh, is going to be uh, like an efficient way of enumerating lattice points. So I actually want to start with this because uh, uh, I'm sure this is something um, many people uh, are, don't know. And it's, it's useful to have uh, tools if you need them. Uh, so this is uh, the tool. Uh, that I uh, wanted to mention. Um, so here uh, you have a, a convex set and you have a lattice. And just don't worry about how the convex set is represented. Essentially, any way you can possibly represent this set uh, usually works. Um, and your goal is to compute all the lattice points inside. Now, uh, uh, if you could do this uh, sort of efficiently, uh, in, in, you know, let's say in two to the n time, uh, then of course you would immediately solve integer programming. But there are many reasons why that won't be possible. Number one, this list could be too big, uh, or uh, sort of it could be uh, uh, empty. Um, 
And uh, uh, you know, so, so you can't expect to get some sort of complexity that only depends on the size of the list. Um, so what does the complexity sort of depend on? So if you have uh, the, the body k and you have the lattice, it turns out that um, a reasonable thing that you can bound the complexity of enumeration by is not like the number of lattice points inside k. So in this case, it would just be one. But it's actually the number of lattice points that you see in the worst shift of k. Um, so for example, here. Okay. Um, and maybe morally, this might make sense. So if I had my body over here, and you could imagine any sort of s interesting way or smooth way of trying to get at the lattice points inside here is relatively likely to start catching the guys on the outside, right? Um, and so, you know, this, to make uh, the measure robust, uh, it turns out that you can measure with respect to the worst case number of lattice points the body can contain. Uh, and it actually turns out that this center is not very difficult to, uh, to compute. I again, we're happy with two to the order n's flying everywhere. Uh, so if you put k such that its center of mass is at the origin, uh, that's the, the x, uh, you, you will basically get the quantity. Um, OK. So this is uh, something uh, uh, I proved together with, with Chris and my advisor, uh, Santosh Ambala, uh, sort of during my, my PhD. And let me just give you like a very brief sense of the kind of tools that go into this. Um, so here is the body that you want to enumerate in. And essentially, the idea is to use uh, a type of uh, ellipsoid. So these are ellipsoids. Um, that um, is kind of uh, roughly the same shape uh, as k. Um, and uh, roughly is basically going to mean that uh, the number of shifts I need uh, of this ellipsoid to fully cover k is a single exponential, and the same thing in reverse. So the number of shifts of, this, uh, of k I need to cover this uh, ellipsoid is also single exponential. And sort of the existence of these ellipsoids uh, uh, was proved by Milman, uh, I guess hence the suggestive name, uh, m ellipsoids. So, once you, once you know that, uh, uh, after some, some work, so as I was mentioning, a lot of this is very impressionistic. So uh, it's not like I expect anyone to understand this in, in detail just to get the, the high level ideas. But if anything seems like super preposterous, you know, ask, ask away, ask a question. Um, but OK, so the idea is you, you try and cover the, the body uh, with uh, the shifts of the ellipsoid. Uh, and then you enumerate all the points inside all of the ellipsoids um, because of this, uh, the shapes being uh, not too far off. This number of points ends up being not too much bigger than uh, the number of points that you can get in K in any translation, basically because you're just going to cover this with copies of K. Um, and that's uh, where you kind of get the bound from. Um, but the interesting question is, why is it easy to uh, enumerate uh, in an ellipsoid? Uh, and this is because the Voronoi cell is amazing. So uh, this is um, uh, uh, sort of taking inspiration from the, the algorithm of, uh, uh, or let's say, insights of uh, uh, Michancho and Volgaris. So if I make the ellipsoid a ball, uh, then um, if I have any shift of it, uh, it turns out that if I create this, this graph, like exactly the same graph that uh, Mathieu was looking at in the previous talk, it turns out that if I intersect all the, all the points in a ball around any target, then um, this graph that I get uh, uh, that follows edges of the uh, Voronoi cell um, is connected. And on top of it, I can actually extract from this. There, there are actually more edges here that I'm not showing. There's sort of this edge, for example, and this edge. But you can extract from it a tree. Uh, and the tree is sort of uh, corresponds to edges that always move you closer to the center of the ellipse. Um, and so if you, if you can sort of get a handle on this graph, you can do something like depth-first search or uh, 
Uh, Matias, are you here? Uh, one, uh, uh, Matthias Kopa told me about a nice technique called reverse search, uh, which allows you to enumerate uh, all of the points inside this graph in low space. So anyway, so this is why it's actually uh, useful you f to reduce to the case of enumerating in balls, um, because we have this amazing structure of the Voronoi cell and this connectivity structure in particular. Um, okay. So, so that's the, the, the kind of hammer, like being able to uh, enumerate lattice points. Um, so uh, now let's say we, we want to solve the integer programming problem. Um, so we're going to distinguish essentially two pictorial cases. One is when the body that you're working with is very, very big. And we're going to um, measure the size of the body in terms of its covering radius. Um, so the covering radius is the, the smallest scaling of the body uh, that always contains lattice points no matter where you shift it, um, or uh, that if you put uh, a scaled copy of the body around every lattice point, you will cover all of space. So in, in, in this context, you can see that, roughly speaking, no matter where I shift k, it's always going to contain uh, a lattice point. And you can check that you know, the covering radius in this particular case is sort of 2 over 3. Uh, and here, if you scale it down anymore, uh, it'll be uh, integer free, uh, because the boundary is the only place you see the lattice points here. Um, OK. So uh, here, I'm really not going to say very much, except for the fact that you know, uh, intuitively, if the body is very big, which uh, actually flips around with the covering radius because it means the covering radius is small, then uh, uh, not only does the, the body contain integer points, but it contains like deep integer points. And so in essence, you can reduce finding uh, an integer point inside a K to finding a uh, sort of approximately closest integer point to the center of K. Uh, and this reduces uh, somehow to an approximate closest vector computation um, in, a, in a general norm. Um, so, so in some sense, in this case, we can already solve the problem in 2 to the order n time, so we're all good. Uh, so the issue is the other case. Um, and the other case is when uh, the body is not fat, so we'll say it's flat. Um, and uh, what are we going to do in this case? We're going to decompose the feasible region. Um, now, for those of you uh, uh, who have seen these types of algorithms, you have seen that in the flat case, you try and decompose the region uh, along uh, integer hyperplanes. Um, now, there is a slightly more general strategy that you can take, uh, which you can index. Um, using essentially this uh, enumeration tool that I described at the beginning, where in, so, so enumerating um, these, these hyperplanes, uh, in this case, you can think of that as taking the sort of projection uh, onto the y-axis, right? And uh, you will get, if I take the body and I project it onto the y-axis, I'm going to get these three points, right? So I can think of sort of taking a, a, a projection, projecting the body. Uh, now this projection, I, should, I can think of it as, in this case, it's like a one by two uh, integer matrix. But nothing really stops me from taking larger projections. Um, and what I want to do is I want to recurse on all of these slices. And you can sort of phrase that in this more general perspective of saying I want to enumerate all the kind of uh, the integers. So everything here will get mapped to an integer, because here's an integer, here's an integer. Uh, so, so any integer point that's in k will get mapped to an integer through this projection. Um, and each of these uh, uh, projected sort of integer points will correspond to a subproblem that I want to solve. So as I was saying, classically, we would project onto one dimension. That would correspond to k equals 1. Uh, but more generally, you can do uh, uh, sort of any dimension. Um, and you can try and use the algorithm that I mentioned at the beginning to, to, to actually compute these subproblems. 
So what benefit does this give you? Um, uh, the benefit it gives you is that it allows you to apply uh, sort of a slightly restated version of uh, a theorem of uh, Kanan and Lovas, which says that if you're in this fat case, uh, sorry, the other case, the flat case, um, then you can find a projection um, such that uh, it projects onto some k-dimensional space. And uh, the worst case number of lattice points you see uh, in, this, uh, in this projection, in any shift of this projection, is essentially 2 to the k times n to the k. All right. So notice that this grows with k. But that's OK, because if I, if I kill off, uh, if I enumerate this, I kill off k dimensions of the problem. And killing off k dimensions uh, is, you know, I'm willing to take more time to do that. And this is basically, I'm creating, roughly speaking, n subproblems per dimension, is the way to think of it. Um, and so maybe this is, uh, see, seems like a, a horrible quantity. Um, and in fact, this is not how uh, the original theorem was stated. Um, and instead, uh, an, easier, an easier quantity you can, you can look at, which turns out to be equivalent, um, is to forget about integer points altogether uh, and just look at the volume. And roughly speaking, the reason why you don't actually have to care about the number of integer points directly is because you know, the difficult case is when the covering radius is exactly 1. Okay. And when the covering radius is exactly 1, um, uh, essentially this, this body will still have large covering radius. If you cover before, you will cover after. Um, and the number of lattice points will always be proportional to volume. In essence, uh, uh, if the body is already quite big, uh, then the number of lattice points you see in it is always, roughly speaking, going to be proportional to volume. Again, if you don't mind single exponential factors flying around. Um, so this is, uh, this is what they, they proved. And the proof is actually, in, in essence, an algorithm. Uh, it, it uses some generalized notion of, a, of an HKZ basis. Um, and if you uh, take it as such, you can actually compute these projections when you need them. And this is what uh, gives you an, essentially an n to the n time algorithm. So that's the smallest constant in the exponent uh, we currently know. However, uh, uh, this, so this doesn't you know, give us any improvement in terms of it's still n to the order n. Um, where could we hope to get an improvement? So this is where the conjecture comes in that, in fact, this estimate is very far from being tight. Uh, and instead of uh, sort of enumerating like n problems per dimension, uh, you, you should be able to find a sparse projection where the projection basically tells you that you only need to enumerate log n problems per dimension. Um, and that's where uh, uh, you, there is hope so assuming this conjecture, there is hope that you can uh, actually get uh, an algorithm with roughly this complexity. The only star here is that uh, you actually have to know how to compute the projection. So if you know it exists, you still need to, pr you, you still need to compute it, and this is not obvious. Um, but that's, that's the conjecture uh, that I want everyone to know. Uh, and. Um, uh, how can we sort of uh, interpret this in perhaps a, a slightly nicer form uh, in terms of something that looks like a duality relationship uh, for, for the covering radius? So here I've been interpreting it in a way that's maybe more useful for an algorithm. But now let me show you the, the sort of duality formula that may look slightly ugly, but, but sort of gives you a sense that uh, something interesting is happening. Um, which is the, the following. You can sort of normalize volumes uh, appropriately. And then you can re-express the conjecture uh, as uh, the following inequality, that the product of the covering radius times the minimum uh, normalized volume of any integer projection should be at most logarithmic in the dimension. Um, and this right-hand side. Uh, uh, you, you will see that this, 
uh, we will prove uh, this in the context of, uh, of the Euclidean norm in a second. Um, but it essentially tells you that uh, anybody, any solution here, so any, inter any integer projection here of any rank, uh, actually gives you a lower bound on the covering radius if you move it to the other side. Uh, and we will interpret this uh, in a second, in the, in the second half of the, the talk, um, where we're going to sort of restrict this question to the case of k being an ellipsoid, uh, or uh, more simply, in the case where k is the ball and we're looking at a general lattice. Okay. So, uh, any questions so far? I'm sure it was all super clear. Okay. Uh, all right, let's continue. Uh, okay, so 15 minutes, is that right? Yeah, I can't quite tell what it is. Yeah, all right. Okay. So uh, uh, now I'm going to reinterpret uh, everything in a different light. So essentially, we're going to reinterpret uh, this kind of uh, duality relation as a way to approximate the covering radius. So hopefully, we, we believe, you know, at least uh, we believe now that the covering radius is sort of an interesting quantity to study. Uh, and uh, we're going to use the, this, this theory specialized to the Euclidean case to, to try and say more interesting things. Uh, and in fact, I mean, the point of this is that uh, uh, the correct, spe the specialization of the kanal novas conjecture to the case of L2 uh, is now proved. But it's, it was proved by. Uh, uh, Noah and Oded, uh, and we're going to sort of cover that theory and, and see uh, the kind of connections that it has. Okay. So, uh, lattices, I've already talked about them apparently. Um, so the, the only thing uh, I want you to remember is that um, the, the determinant um, is, uh, is not only the, the volume of a fundamental parallel piped, but also the volume of any uh, domain that tiles space with respect to the lattice. So in particular, that tells me that um, the determinant is also equal to the volume of the Voronoi cell. Right. Um, so the L2 covering radius, now that I have a general lattice, uh, I can think of it sort of uh, geometrically in the following sense. Um, I look at the Voronoi cell, and I just look at the point on the Voronoi cell that's as far away from the origin as possible. And that's going to be one of the vertices. Okay. So that's uh, the smallest ball that contains the Voronoi cell um, is the covering radius. Um, and so now let's uh, just talk very briefly about the complexity of the computational problem uh, of approximating the covering radius. Okay, so what, what is the, the, the problem? Um, you are given uh, an approximation factor, you're given a lattice give, uh, given by its basis, and you either want to decide in a yes instance whether the covering radius is at most something, uh, or in a no instance whether the covering radius is at least alpha times that something. Um, and uh, uh, what, what was known about this problem, so up to about, uh, let's say, 15 years ago? Um, so uh, 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 Guru Swami, Daniele, and, 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 and Oded uh, sort of looked at this problem in, in detail. Um, and combining uh, uh, sort of many different known results as well as some new results, they were able to show um, this kind of range of approximation factors. So you, you start from, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, two to the n approximations, you can actually uh, approximate the covering radius in polynomial time. Uh, if you don't mind a Rudin approximation, then there are certificates, both that the covering radius is large uh, and that it's small. So the covering radius being small, you can basically give a short basis of the lattice. Um, and uh, 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 another very interesting result is that if you have access to uh, 
um, a prover, an all-powerful uh, all powerful prover, you can upper bound the covering radius up to a factor of two. Okay, essentially, you, you send the prover a random coset of the lattice, and you ask him to tell you uh, what the distance of that coset is uh, uh, from the lattice. So he, he, could, he basically just needs to return a closest vector to a randomly given target. Um, and basically, you can convince yourself that uh, a randomly chosen target is basically a distance covering radius over 2. Okay, this is actually quite easy to prove. And that means that you know, the, the prover will, will, will be able to, to uh, uh, I mean, will always be able to return a point to you that's a distance less than covering radius if he wants to. Uh, and since you chose a random point, it will very likely be within a factor two of the covering radius. So this is where the two comes from. Um, so the covering radius is a very uh, robust uh, property. What does A stand for? Uh, it's Arthur Merlin. So uh, uh, sort of Arthur is, is, is you. And uh, you, you're, you're asking Merlin, uh, who is an all-powerful prover, to convince you that the covering radius is small. So you, as Arthur, will send Merlin a random coset of the lattice. And he will respond to you, here is the closest point to this coset. Uh, you know, and uh, do with that information what you will. Um, so that's, that's AM. All right. And so, I, I mean, this wasn't, I, I think, kind of noted at the time, but essentially the Euclidean version of the kanan novas conjecture, at least if you don't, if you, uh, let's say, interpret it liberally with uh, polylogarithmic factors, um, it actually gives you um, uh, a certificate that the covering radius is large that is tight up to a polylogarithmic factor. Which, would, which from here you can see is uh, an exponential improvement in the uh, Cohen P uh, classification. And so what happened uh, uh, since then? So this is sort of really the last few years. Um, so first, uh, the, the, the conjecture, the kanan lovas conjecture was actually proved. So this is uh, Odette and Noah. Uh, I... Um, uh, gave sort of an improved type of certificate. So this is something I will mention uh, maybe hopefully by the end of the talk. Uh, and in fact, um, if, you, uh, if you are allowed to use these sort of more interesting, more powerful uh, uh, certificates, then uh, it's highly likely at this point uh, that you can certify the covering radius up to a constant factor, um, which I think is quite surprising. Um, which maybe also illustrates that the covering radius is somewhat of a magical quantity that, you know, uh, deserves uh, uh, lots of study. Um, and then uh, also this AM protocol, or at least let's say the, the, um, uh, the guarantee that this AM protocol gives was improved uh, by, by Magazinov. He certainly didn't know what AM meant, but... Uh, that's what his uh, results implies in the context of this picture. Um, OK. Uh, so the, yeah, I tried to color code it. It may be, so the square root of 3 is Magazino. Uh, and then, yeah, the red is, uh, is, is me. And then uh, no on no dead is the uh, log to the 3 half sign. So before it was 2, the constant. Yes. And that's the easy proof. And this one is uh, more interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it, yeah. I, think if, I know the paper you're talking about. I think it's after the paper was written, it was discovered to have already been proved about 10 years ago in French. <laughs> OK, cool. Uh, OK. I mean, proved it mathematically rigorously, but written. OK, OK. Hail to the French. Yes. Uh, very cool. OK. Um, yeah, so many people like the covering radius. Um, all right, so let's try and, and, and say something about uh, how to interpret uh, uh, this kanan lovas conjecture in, 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 in L2 and, and the sort of connections around it. Um, so some notation. Um, so if I have a sublattice of dimension k, I'm going to write nd to be the normalized determinant. So I don't, ha don't want to have to normalize by 1 over k everywhere, so I'm just going to write nd for normalized determinant. Uh, 
Um, and if I have a sublattice, uh, I'm just going to use this notation uh, to denote uh, projecting L orthogonal to the span of the sublattice. Okay. Um, good. So again, we have our, our covering radius. Um, and I want to uh, get you to how you, you, you get to lower bounds based on uh, basically volumes of projections. Um, and this will be uh, uh, quite simple. Um, so I, I want to lower bound the covering radius so that we get to the kind of correct version of, of kanan lovas for, this, for the L2 norm in the case of general lattices. So what we'll, what we'll do is we'll just start with the kind of obvious uh, volumetric uh, uh, comparison. So if we start with the ball of radius covering radius, well, it contains the Voronoi cell, so it has larger volume. The Voronoi cell is a tiling domain, so the volume is determinant. And now if you kind of rearrange that expression and use the fact that volume is homogeneous to the power n, uh, you get uh, this lower bound. Um, and because we know exactly uh, what the volume of the ball is, um, we can replace this and note that it is essentially up to constant factors equal to square root of n times uh, the normalized determinant of the lattice. Okay. So this is uh, the volumetric lower bound you will get on the covering radius if you use the full space. Uh, however, this can be improved. Um, so in this case, it won't be because the lattice is sort of very nice and, uh, and uh, sort of round. But if your lattice sort of looked like this, um, then you could see that the determinant might become very small because you have one very dense direction. So you should project it out. <coughs> and if you look at uh, the lattice and you compare it to its sort of projection, the covering radius of the projection will sort of only go down because projections decrease uh, distances. Um, and now we just apply exactly the same lower bound on the projection. Right, so if uh, I apply the lower bound on this, uh, on this projection, which is projecting orthogonal to this particular sublattice, I get a new lower bound. And so I can now maximize this lower bound over all sublattices. Okay. Now, I mean, uh, to, to be clear, at the end, this really only depends on the span of M, but it, it'll be somewhat useful to have this uh, formalism uh, in a sec. So I can, um, so what I, I just showed in the previous slide is that essentially this is a lower bound for the covering radius. And the kanan lovas question restricted to L2 is asking for the reverse inequality. So we want to know um, how close are these lower bounds to being tight. And so you can define uh, what uh, one can call the kind of L2 kanan lovas constant which says, uh, the, which gives you exactly the tightness factor uh, of this inequality with respect to the worst case lattice. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, so some easy uh, uh, lower bounds on this uh, quantity, in fact, you can get them uh, from a very, very simple lattice. Uh, which is just uh, the appropriate sort of scaling of Zn. Uh, and you can convince yourself that this quantity has to be at least square root log of n. Right? And this is sort of in the spirit of, for many of the conjectures, such as this one and uh, reverse Minkowski, uh, the belief is that the interesting lattices or the hard cases are you know, sort of the stupid ones. Um, and, uh, and those are, uh, so, so in essence, you can conjecture uh, uh, from an intuitive level that uh, what we're trying to say is that the, the, in this particular case is that this is the worst example. Okay. Oops. Up to, uh, you know, small twiddling. All right. So this is the L2 canon of us conjecture. Are you also destroying the, condition, the conditioning number of the gram matrix in this case? Uh, so, uh, down to one over square root of n in the base. In 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 uh, in this case, it's essentially what you're doing by doing this is uh, 
it, 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 it's essentially making it so that uh, all of these determinants, which end up being like, uh, like the, the bounds that you would get from this, uh, are basically going to be like, take the projection onto the first k coordinates uh, and compute the sort of determinant there. And what will happen is that this term is going to cancel out with the product of the 1 over the square root of i's to the power 1 over i, um, or to the power 1 over k, where k is the restriction of the, of the thing. So essentially, this is exactly going to cancel out with that. Um, uh, so that's what that does. Um, OK, so uh, now I'm going to try and, and say uh, something about a tool that uh, I also know that many of us are, are uh, not familiar with, um, which I also wasn't familiar with a few years ago, uh, and is uh, sort of an amazingly useful concept uh, that is essentially going to give us a ca canonical way of decomposing a lattice into almost orthogonal blocks. Um, and uh, uh, this, this tool, uh, well, there's first the picture, which is this is called the canonical polygon. Uh, it was, was it defined by Stuhler or early, even earlier? I think, uh, I call it Arden or Simon, and I think Arden or Simon a few years before. A few years before, okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, so uh, 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 first the picture, and then uh, the actual kind of consequence of the picture. Um, so what are we drawing? We're drawing a, sort of this 2D plot with the x-coordinate being the dimension of sublattices. And then the y-coordinate, we're plotting uh, the sort of log determinant of uh, sublattices of that dimension. And we're actually only interested in the smallest. Uh, for every dimension, we're really mostly interested in the um, sublattice of that rank or of that dimension of smallest determinant, which means we only care about the bottom of this, uh, of this curve. OK? Um, and so 0, 0, by the way, is uh, so 0 corresponds to like the trivial lattice. Uh, you know, that is uh, just the lattice with uh, only the origin in it. And we sort of declare that uh, its determinant is 1, so its log determinant is 0. Uh, at the very end, you get n times log determinant of the lattice. OK, and now what we look at is we're going to look at the lower convex hull of this thing. And why is this going to be kind of an interesting thing to look at? Um, basically, because it's going to index for us uh, a very special chain of lattices uh, that is called the canonical filtration. So what happens is that if you look at this lower convex hull, the vertices of it uh, have unique lattices that map to them. So there is only one lattice that has uh, this log determinant of that dimension, and that is L1. And there is only one lattice that ha of, of this dimension that has uh, this lowest log determinant here that is a vertex of the, of the polygon, and that is L2. And the most amazing thing is that these lattices actually form a chain. So you will get that this, is, well, is contained inside anything, in particular inside L1, and L1 is contained inside L2, and so on and so forth. Why it's unique? Why uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, so this uses a, a sort of, let's say, log uh, submodularity of the determinant. So like everything is based on the, this inequality. So if you take, uh, OK, I think this is correct. Um, if you take any two uh, sublattices of L, then if you look at the uh, determinant of uh, m1 times the determinant of m2, um, then it should be bigger than the uh, determinant of the intersection uh, times the determinant of the, um, uh, of the sort of sum of these lattices. Is that right, Noah? It looks right. It looks right. Um, so if you, if you take the log, um, it basically tells you that the, the function log det uh, 
um, over the space of sublattices is, uh, uh, is submodular. And essentially, uh, uh, this is where you get to draw these lines. Um, in essence, like you, if you had sort of two lattices that were here, you could kind of uh, do this. Um, and these would core. So if you had two lattices that went here, you would get two other lattices that would be, say, here and here, whose uh, average of logs, which is essentially equal to that, would be below this point. Um, but it, and actually, so that's really all you need to prove all of these properties. So it's actually quite. Uh, L yes, it's not difficult to prove. Um, uh, yeah, so it's there's it also why it's a good thing to know. It's not actually very difficult to work with. Um, so uh, uh, good. So what what uh, things do you uh, do you get? You get things like I can tell you what the slopes are. So the slope of this piece is exactly what I get by taking the log of the normalized determinants of L2 mod L1, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll say that a lattice uh, is, is stable or uh, semi-stable. Uh, no, stable? No, this is semi-stable, I guess. Uh, if uh, uh, the canonical filtration is trivial, which means that the only thing you see here is the straight line, and there are no uh, vertices in between. Um, and what else did I want to say? Yeah, so one important thing is that if I take this canonical filtration, then uh, in terms of the stability concept, uh, you can kind of already see it from the straight lines here that uh, this block is stable. So every block, so L divided by L2 or L2 divided by L1, mod L1, both of, all of those are stable. Um, okay. Another property that's really nice also is... Yes, 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 uh, yes. I actually had that picture at some point and I, I, I forgot to put it back in. But yes, uh, if, you, if you take... Uh, if you uh, take the dual lattice, you have exactly the same picture, but reflected uh, uh, around the uh, around uh, whatever n over two. Um, so uh, it al that that also like tells you that if a lattice is stable, then the polar uh, la the dual lattice is also stable. Um, so. Uh, the, st uh, the stable lattices are, are, are or the, this canonical filtration is going to essentially allow us to reduce like all the analysis associated with this uh, uh, kanan lovas conjecture to uh, the set of stable lattices. Basically, the blocks that you saw before are going to be our little stable pieces. Uh, and what's very important about these blocks is that um, Essentially, if you think about the, the lower bound uh, that you get uh, for the covering radius, because the, the, if you s restrict to a stable lattice, then the lower bound is trivially maximized on the full lattice, like as in there is no reason to project. Um, and uh, I mean, you can convince yourself of this, but it's, it's basically breaking up uh, the lattice in, into chunks where on each chunk, the kind of trivial lower bound uh, that uh, you have at the top level for this uh, for the sequence of lower bounds you get from Kanan and Lovas, um, that is the tight one. Okay, so if you start with a, a stable lattice and let's normalize in this case for the lattice to have determinant one, then uh, the the sort of uh, the only lower bound you get uh, is uh, is square root of the dimension. Right, the determinant is one, so square root of the dimension is a lower bound on the determinant. Because the lattice is stable, there's no reason to go to anything else. Uh, and so this is essentially uh, you know, the kanon lovas constant, but restricted to stable lattices. Okay. Uh, and apparently this had sort of already been studied uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, Barak and, uh, and uh, uh, and Shapira, or Barak Weiss and, and, and Shapira, and uh, in the context of yet another conjecture of Minkowski's, 
Uh, or, uh, yes. And uh, the, the, the conjecture in this context, which he mentioned in the open problem session, is that this, this constant should exactly be a half, which is saying nothing else than uh, the integer lattice is the worst case. So among all stable lattices, the one that maximizes this constant is the integer lattice. OK. So now I want to remark that it's, there's another conjecture that I didn't mention in the problem session of Mathieu, which also applies this. There's a, another conjecture about covering radii, local maximum of the covering radius function, uh -huh. which is due to Mathieu to two secrets, and it implies this conjecture. OK. Very cool. So, uh, so sort of let's take this as, um, uh, uh, as a given for a second. Um, and, and sort of look at what, uh, what it gives you. Um, so uh, one inequality I didn't write here. Um, so this is uh, uh, due to sort of no one or dead that kind of linked these two concepts together, um, which uh, the first inequality, I just want to write out one line of it on the, on, on, on the board in terms of the derivation. Um, it's just the following. So if I look at the covering radius squared, uh, it's actually, um, so here I'm starting with this canonical filtration, which I was mentioning is the right way of breaking up a lattice into orthogonal blocks. Um, and uh, if I have my uh, canonical filtration, if, you know, for those of you who are sort of familiar with the analysis of kind of Babai's algorithm, um, then uh, uh, maybe it won't be very difficult to interpret the fact that if I have um, broken up the lattice into, into blocks, so the blocks are these li's mod like li minus 1, uh, that I can kind of trivially upper bound the covering radius um, by the sum of the, the squared covering radius by the sum of the squares of the covering radii over the blocks. Right? So uh, the sum of the squares of the covering radii uh, over the blocks. OK? Sorry, I don't need to square this uh, multiple times. Um, but this is basically uh, a Babai style analysis. OK, so you kind of round uh, to the nearest uh, lattice point on the, on the lowest block, and then you lift it uh, bit by bit by bit. Uh, and the errors are going to add up in orthogonal subspaces, and each error is going to be upper bounded by the covering radius of that block. Okay, so this is just Babai. This next line is by definition. Uh, each of these blocks is stable. Uh, so just by definition, this is the lower bound or the upper bound that you get. Okay? Um, and now, uh, if you do a little bit of kind of algebraic trickery, which is some kind of reverse form of the arithmetic geometric mean inequality, uh, you can get this last expression. Uh, and this last expression turns out to be exactly the kind of uh, uh, lower bound that you get by projecting orthogonal to one of the uh, the elements of the filtration. So this right here is a good kanon lovas projection. And in particular, what this tells you is uh, that um, the kanan lovas constant is at most the sort of square root of what you have here, which is the square root of log times uh, what you get for stable lattices. OK? So, so the whole problem reduces to stable lattices in like three lines, um, which would have been very nice to know a few years ago. Uh, good. So what can you say about stable lattices? Um, so I'm definitely going over time. <laughs> okay. Uh, what can you, so, so here are some very nice links to uh, a convex geometry. Um, so it turns out that uh, uh, there are many, you know, different characterizations of, uh, of what these, con or what you can relate these constants to. So one very nice one, also due to uh, Odette and Noah, um, is that if you look at, uh, at this uh, like, uh, constant for, for stable lattices, um, it can be associated with a classical uh, constant in the context of convex geometry, uh, 
uh, which is called the slicing constant. Um, so every convex body, every sim well, let's say every symmetric convex body, you can associate a number is called the slicing constant, uh, which is basically um, uh, uh, the, the, the following number. It sort of tells you that if you scale the body to have volume 1, and in fact, if you apply any um, um, volume-preserving transformation, you will always be able to find a slice of the body that has uh, volume at least 1 over the slicing constant. Okay? And it's, it's conjectured that for every single convex body in any single dimension, that the slicing constant is always order 1. This is a conjecture of Bourguin. Uh, and if you restrict this conjecture to Voronoi cells of stable lattices, and you look at the, the worst case slicing constant you get for that, this is equivalent to that number. Okay, so, well, I mean, in, it's up to, it's theta of one of that, right? But, I mean, it's more precise, but I just don't have the time to, to be more precise about it. But this is where the magazine of stuff. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. So, I, in in fact, I mean, there's a there's a better way of defining, or there's a, a very specific way of defining this in terms of uh, the covariance matrix of the convex body, but I, I just didn't feel like going there uh, at this point. The way you defined it, it's not up to a square root three, but the other. Correct. Uh, yes, that's why I put theta of one. Um, so, so this is uh, connecting a sort of very well-known conjecture in convex geometry uh, to this problem. Uh, and in particular, if you resolve the slicing conjecture, then at least up to a constant, you resolve uh, uh, Barak's conjecture. And if you resolve it strongly, uh, then you would uh, exactly resolve Barak's conjecture, but I won't get into that. Um, and uh, sort of what else uh, do we know? So these are the kind of, this is where the effective bounds on, these, on this constant comes from. Uh, so this is the kind of, uh, let's say, reverse Minkowski constant uh, that uh, uh, essentially was introduced by, uh, by Noah in the first, uh, in the first talk. Um, and uh, uh, the question is, uh, how big is this constant? So you take any stable lattice, how much do I have to scale it uh, so that its Gaussian mass is, is less than 2. So I conjectured with Oded that it was uh, polylogarithmic uh, in dimension. And then um, uh, uh, Noah and Oded proved it. Um, and in particular, if you want to understand uh, this, uh, the, the constant from the previous slide, um, sort of already, if you do apply what was known from the, the tools of, of Banaschek, uh, this constant is bigger than that one. Okay, so the, the, the slicing constant for Voronoi cells of stable lattices is at most the reverse Minkowski constant. Uh, and so if you uh, put it all together, you get uh, uh, the kind of polylogarithmic bounds uh, that I was mentioning previously. Okay, so then... Uh, uh, very quickly, I will try and like mention what the new stuff is, um, or just a couple of them, and then we'll we'll stop. Um, so the first thing is, uh, can you can you do better for approximating the covering radius in the sense that we saw that there's so much structure in this in this question? The Kanan and Lova sort of certificates look at exactly one projection, and uh, if you look at the the sort of form of the, the kind of things we had before, you would wonder if you can get, if you can somehow chain information together from different uh, projections. Uh, and the answer is yes, you can. Um, so you can actually show if you start from any chain of lattices, and here I, I put a simplifying assumption uh, which isn't quite needed, uh, uh, which tells you that the sort of you can think of this as something that is trying to be the canonical filtration, but you're not sure that it is. Uh, you look at the kind of slopes of the filtration that you get, and they should just be increasing. Um, and you get the following lower bound uh, uh, starting from any chain. Okay? Uh, and the, the important thing to remember is that if you saw, uh, looked at what Oded and, and Noah proved, 
they essentially proved exactly the same inequality, but in reverse with this extra constant. Okay. So in particular, if you plug in the canonical filtration here, you uh, uh, get something that is, that is tight up to uh, a constant uh, that is this uh, slicing constant of Voronoi cells, basically. Uh, and that, this is a certificate that you can check in polynomial time. So it tells you that uh, conjecturally up to a constant factor, the covering radius problem is in cohen p. Um, what else can we say? Uh, so I won't go into, the, into the, the proofs of anything. You can actually appro uh, compute these things uh, approximately. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more about that. Uh, Jim, uh, you can actually sort of use these ideas to upper bound the, the slicing constant of arbitrary Voronoi cells, not just Voronoi cells of stable lattices. So um, uh, the, the theory allows you quite easily to, to uh, kind of say new things in the context of convex geometry. Um, you uh, 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 also, uh, getting back to the sort of very, very original motivation, so this I want to spend two seconds on, you can get a very small improvement uh, conjecturally uh, on uh, uh, the running time uh, for IP. Um, and this is based uh, just on the following uh, 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 question or parameter, you might, you might say. So, uh, and this, I think, is a fantastic way of sort of exploring consequences of the kanan novas conjecture uh, and possibly the, the simplest implication uh, of it that, that one can play around with. So uh, what happens is you can look at the difference in the covering radius between uh, a body and its symmetrization. So its symmetrization is you add uh, its, uh, you look at all uh, A minus B, where A is in K and B is in K, so the, it's, a, it's a much bigger body to some extent. Um, but uh, the question is how much bigger? And can you, um, can you upper bound sort of uh, how much the covering radius is going to drop when you symmetrize a body? Um, and as a, co a consequence of the kanan lovas conjecture is that if it's true, then this drop can at most be uh, log n. Okay. Um, and if that happens to be true, so if this drop is at most log n, you get essentially n to the n over 2 algorithm for IP, which beats the constant by a factor of 2. Um, and uh, uh, so, so that's, that's it. So these are some open problems. Uh, and um, um, so I learned very recently uh, from uh, Zvika Barkerski that I have an alter ego. Uh, and uh, uh, to uh, uh, help with my alter ego's business, as part of, in addition to the cash prize, I can also offer uh, tortillas uh, saburito. Which are, uh, so apparently this is Daniel de Douche, uh, you know, whole, wholesale foods or something. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, this is also, I guess, my, my, my opportunity, you know, in case lattices don't work out. Um, okay, thank you very much. Right. Do we have time for questions? Uh, well, we don't. Have, we are already over time, but there are questions, of course. So yeah, it's. Uh, well, I can ask. I can yeah. ask. So my question is: You had this, you know, this uh, application that you really went over very, very quickly about the um, uh, applications to convex geometry. Yeah. Go back to that slide and just say again. Yeah. So 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 now you might want wonder. We've so, so the the connection to the slicing conjecture you know, it was only for stable lattices. So Voronoi cells are stable lattices, and you can say, okay, can we actually prove something for arbitrary Voronoi cells? Uh, and uh, uh, the, the answer is yes. And essentially what you can prove is that any Voronoi cell, you can build uh, an ellipsoid that contains it, such that the ratio of volumes between uh, the Voronoi cell and the, uh, oh, I think, 
I think actually, sorry, this should have been flipped. That the volume of the ellipsoid is at most this much, which is the canon Lovas constant, uh, times the volume of the, uh, of the Voronoi cell. And this, this is uh, basically bounds what's known as the outer volume ratio of the Voronoi cell. And if you do that, it's well known that you kind of immediately get the same upper bound on the slicing constant. So that's, that's, that's what you get to. Okay, all right. Then let's thank Dan and all the speakers of the world.